So, nice to meet you all. Thank you for joining me. My name is Martin and I'm going to discuss with you what's cooking in Maven. But before we do that, I have a little question for you. Can you tell me what the difference is between those two? And maybe the emojis already give it away a little bit. On the left hand side, we see, we see the Spring Initializer website, which by default suggests you to generate a Gradle project. On the right hand side, we see the MicroProfile Starter website, which by default suggests to generate a Maven project for you. And this is not by coincidence. The Spring team actually deliberately, deliberately chose to migrate to Gradle as a default choice for a build tool. They have a GitHub issue describing the choice and the rationale behind it. And somewhere in that issue, there's a comment from a fellow Maven committer, Martin Kampus, who said, I wanted to mention that Maven is working on a lot of the nice things that were mentioned above. Most of them are already available for use. And it's exactly those things that I would like to share with you today. So without further ado, we are going to discuss what's cooking in Maven. As I said, my name is Martin Mulders. I'm a Java champion. I'm an Oracle AS Pro, and I'm, I'm working at InfoSupport. If you would look us up, we're a consultancy firm. And you might be wondering, what is a consultancy firm doing in terms of Apache Maven, which is an open source project after all? Well, the thing is that we benefit from open source in a lot of the projects that we run with our customers. And in the true spirit of open source, we decided that we would like to give back to the community. And we do that by providing um, man hours or, or working time actually to contribute into the project, report issues, fix issues, contribute new features, et cetera. And it's in that um, capacity that I'm speaking about Apache Maven today. So we'll be discussing a few things that are cooking in Maven. And we will be doing that in the form of a traditional French four course dinner. So the menu du jour or the menu for today consists of an entree, which, uh, which will show the Maven wrapper. We will have our plat principal or main course, which is going to build to be the build and consumer pond decoupling. Le fromage, the cheeses that go after the main course is uh, a couple of nice improvements in the reactor. And we will wrap up with a dessert, which is going to be the Maven Demon. If you have any questions, I would really like to answer them. Please keep them until the end of the talk. And then we will have some time left to discuss any questions you may have. So let's get started with the entree or the, uh, the, the uh, oh, I forgot the English word. Never mind. Uh, it's going to be the Maven wrapper. And if I say Maven wrapper, you might be thinking, hey, we already know that one, right? I mean, the Maven wrapper is not something uh, that is really new. So let's let's take a step back for a second and see what the Maven wrapper is all about. And the Maven wrapper is actually a little utility that helps us ensure that the users of our open source project or actually our project in general uh, have everything that they need so they can build a project. And typically the version of Maven does not really make a big difference, but in some cases it may. And we maybe we don't even want to force our users to download Maven upfront. That's where we can use Maven Wrapper because Maven Wrapper will actually um, download Maven even if the user does not have it installed. The Maven Wrapper is a, uh, is a shell script which runs on Linux, Mac OS, Solaris. It even runs on Windows. Can you imagine that? And it makes sure that we as project maintainers do no longer have to worry about the version of Maven that my users may have. I don't have to write something in my readme like make sure that you use Maven at least version this or that because the wrapper will automatically download the appropriate version for me. So let's move to the kitchen and let's get cooking and see how that actually works. Now I've prepared a demo for that. Here we have a project, uh, which is uh, nothing too special. In fact, I can actually open it in, uh, in an editor 
And we can see that we have a pondered XML, which just says, well, use, Mavis, uh, use Java 17. And for uh, there's nothing special uh, in terms of the project any, uh, except for that. So what can we do here? We can actually generate the wrapper script. And we used to be doing that using uh, Maven. Um, wait, there's a quick way to do that. We can just say, run the Takari wrapper for me. And it runs the Takari Maven wrapper plugin, which generates a wrapper for us. This is what we had for years already. It will generate a Maven wrapper folder. It will generate MVNW and MVNW.cmd. But as I said, this is the Takari wrapper. And the thing that is changed now is that we have um, ported that or actually moved that into the umbrella of the Apache Software Foundation. So let's remove the generated wrapper stuff and let's generate the wrapper again, this time using another helper script, which will just say run wrapper column wrapper and use Maven 386. Well, again, it says build success, which is great. And we can see again that we have a Maven W script a Maven WCMD and a .mvn folder. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so let's see if it actually uh, runs. And for that, I'm going to spin up a clean um, environment. Oh, well, that works actually better if Docker is running. So let's wait a second for that to boot. So what it's going to do is going to spin up a clean Linux container with only Java installed, but not with Maven installed. Let's try it again. There it is. No, it's still not there. Too bad. Still booting. Yes, there we have it. So just to double check, we have Java installed with version 17, but we do not have Maven installed because if we run MVN, we cannot uh, uh, run that. But we have our executable helper script, MVNW, and we can uh, run that and say, uh, for instance, validate my project setup. And it will immediately start validating the projects. Well, this wasn't too much fun because it was actually all there. Let's make it a really clean environment. All right, excellent. Um, let's see, product has been uh, built. We could even compile it uh, like so. We can see that it downloads everything which is, is expected because we did not have Maven installed up front. Now, how does that work? It works because here in the M2 folder that we know for its repository, we also find we will also find the wrapper folder, which contains a distribute distributions folder, which then contains the version of Maven that we expect to be there. And then finally we have a bin folder and that shows us the clean Maven installation that has been downloaded. We could remove that. We could run the project again with the MVNW wrapper. And then again, Maven is going to be downloaded. And even when I did not have Maven installed, I can still run Maven um, because that prerequisite is going to be downloaded for me. So as I said, this is, isn't too much of a rocket science. It's something that has been there already, but it required to use an external plugin. Now it's part of Maven itself. We ship with, uh, uh, it, it will actually be easier to invoke because rather than running IO Takari column wrapper, we can run Maven wrapper at the end of the day. But later, more about that later in the talk. This was just to get started to boost up our appetite a little bit.
the main course for today is going to be the build and consumer palm decoupling. And this is a rather technical uh, improvement that we brought into Maven, but it's really essential as we will see in a minute. So what does it do? The build consumer palm decoupling, as the name already suggests, will decouple the palm that we have in version control from the palm that lives in a repository. So the palm that gets deployed to your local repository or to uh, a company repository like Artifactory or, or whatever, um, or even to Maven Central. So what we have until today is that the pom.xml that we have in version control is literally copied, deployed into a, a local, a company, or even the central Maven repository. There are a few exceptions to the rule. Uh, if we would use, for instance, the Maven Flatten plugin, a few transformations can be done uh, to get from the project structure that lives here until the, the pond that is deployed up there. But generally speaking, it's the, it's the very same file. And this is actually something that um, poses a few uh, interesting problems. So what the build, build and consumer POM decoupling does for us is that it says, well, the POM that we deploy no longer has to be the very same file as the file that lives in your project structure. So why is this interesting? Well, this actually is the first step on the road to, um, to transform the POM that we know today. Let's imagine for a second that we have Maven 6. And in Maven 6, the structure of the POM is completely different from the POM that we know today and that we have today. If I would be using Maven 6 to build my project, and I would be deploying the very same POM file that lives in my project structure to Maven Central, it would mean that whoever is going to download that project from Maven Central is going to get a POM that works on Maven 6. But if they are on Maven 5 or 4 or 3 or even 2, as for today, there are still people using Maven 2. And well, that, that's fine because it's a very stable product. It would mean that they will get a POM.xml from Central that their tool simply doesn't understand. And that's going to be quite a problem for them because their tool will say, this is an invalid POM. I can't process this, this, this dependency or this plugin. So by saying the POM that we have on disk is not the same as the POM that gets deployed, it allows us to say, well, our project uses, let's say, Maven 6. But before we deploy the POM to Maven Central, let's transform it to make sure that it is valid even back until Maven 3 or 2 or whatever we choose to. And this is a very important step because if we would not do this, it would simply be impossible to, trans uh, to, um, to, to, to change the structure of the POM that we have today. And the important uh, constraint here is that we do want to change the POM. We do want to be able to do that without breaking the whole ecosystem that Java relies upon. Let's face it, even if you say, well, I'm not a big Maven fan, I'm, I, I'd rather use Gradle, the POM, .xml that lives next to each jar in Maven Central is kind of the cornerstone for the Java ecosystem and for, for a lot of tools. Whether it's Ivy, whether it's Gradle, whether it's SBT, they all rely on the pom.xml to contain the metadata for each uh, artifact that they download. So we have to be sure that that thing is very, very stable. So again, let's move to the kitchen. Let's see what it actually looks like if we do this. And for that, I have prepared another demo, which is very interestingly named to build consumer POM decoupling. Um, let's see, build consumer, that's this one. And um, this feature is not in Maven 3, but um, I'm using, uh, it, it is not in Maven 3. Um, so to make sure, 
that I'm using Maven 3. I'm going to type Maven 3 here, and I can also type Maven 4, which is going to be a snapshot of what is going to be Maven 4. Let's just highlight that for a second. MVN 3 says I'm using Maven 3.8.6. MVN 4 says I'm using Maven 4.0.0 Alpha 3 snapshot. So just to, to get that out of the way. So I can say Maven 3 uh, compile, for instance, and I can build my project, which is just fine. And we can see here that we have a project which consists of an application and a library and a, uh, a, a root project. That's also highlighted um, here. The application, the library, and the root project. Now, if we have such a setup, it usually requires us to say, okay, in the lib, so in any child project, I need to specify the version of my parent, right? If I would do this, for instance, and I could do the same thing in the app, by the way, then Maven 3 will not be able to compile the project. Because it says, hey, you need to have parent version specified, and you did not. Now, if I would be using Maven 4, Maven 4 will say, oh, that's fine. I can just compile it. Why does that work? Because Maven 4 says, okay, by convention, or actually by convention, by specification, there's also a relative path here. And we typically don't specify it because it's default value, which is this, it's just fine. Now, if the relative path is not specified, then it is the upper directory. So let's inspect the upper directory, which is this one and see if the group ID and artifact ID match with what we have here, they do. So then the version doesn't really matter. You could still specify the version to actually pin it, but if you want your child modules to, um, to version in the same way as your parent modules, then you can just leave it out. You could even say, hey, I have a dependency on another module in my project. And here again, we always need to specify the version even if the dependency to that other module is the same version as this module. Well, with Maven 4, we no longer have to do that. So I can still safely compile my project. What I could even do, I could install my project and that, then we will see something interesting, apart from the fact, of course, that project still builds fine. We can, um, inspect the pom.xml here that just got deployed. And we will see that it still has the version in the parent reference and the version in the app to lib dependency. So I did not specify them in the pom.xml that I have in version control for my project. But when I deploy it to my local repository or to Maven Central for that matter, then the build consumer POM decoupling will actually fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks, and make sure that the POM is still valid for Maven 3, or Maven 2 for that matter. So I'm using a newer version of Maven here to build the project, but any consumer of my project who is not on Maven 4 yet can still safely use the artifacts that I have published. And that, in a nutshell, is what the build consumer POM decoupling does. We can also see that without installing, by the way, we can say help effective POM. Um, and it will do the same thing. It will output the effective POM.xml. And there we will also see, if we browse up a little bit, the version for the parent specified and the version for our dependency is specified as well. So that was our main course, the, the, the coupling of the build and consumer POM. It's time to move to the fromage, the cheeses.
which are a couple of nice improvements in the Maven reactor. So what is the Maven reactor? The Maven reactor is actually the part of Maven that inspects your workspace, so the vault where you're currently in, inspects the project, builds up the structure, builds up, so as to say, the mental model of what your project structure looks like. And this is especially relevant in the context of multi-module projects. Now, the thing is, when it was built into Maven 3, there were a few things left, um, well, not implemented yet, let's put it that way. For instance, if you would uh, say, I'm going to build uh, only a sub-module of the project, then what Maven would do, it would inspect the POMXML in your current folder, and it would say, okay, this is the project, I'm going to build it. But if that project is actually uh, a part of a multi-module project, it has a parent in the upper folder, then Maven 3 would not recognize that. So it would consider the project to be standalone rather than trying to understand the fact that your project is part of a bigger whole. And that's what we've been addressing for Maven 4. We used to say, describe it like this, the reactor is now fully root project aware. So it understands that whether you're building the whole project or just a part of it, it's always um, the whole project that it will, it will always consider the whole project rather than just the folder that you are currently building or the pond that you're currently building. There's one caveat for this. Your project should have a .mvn folder. Then the MVN folder should live at the root of your project structure and it's, um, and you can even leave that folder empty, it's no problem, but it, it, it serves as a marker for Maven to understand if I'm traversing up the directory structure, at some point I can stop doing that. Otherwise, I would be traversing up all the way until slash on uh, macOS and Linux or all the way up until C drive on Windows, which doesn't make sense. I'm not going to find any more Maven projects there. This folder.mvn is the marker. This is the root folder of the project. And inside that folder, you can put additional files, jvm.config, maven.args, the maven wrapper actually lives there. But even if you don't use any of these, you can have the folder and just keep it empty. Make sure it's checked into version control so that others will benefit from that as well. And why is this important? It's important because um, I believe that the fact that Maven 3 did not, um, was not aware of the, the, the root project in a multi-module setup was actually one of the main courses for people still being used to typing MVN install to, to build their projects. I've seen way too many projects um, that had instructions like, before working on the project, make sure to run the MVN install first, which actually is just not right. You shouldn't be doing that. It's, it's actually a workaround for the fact that Maven does not work as one would expect. So let's see what that means in practice. I have a new project for this. Um, what's its name again? Um, yes, there it is, improved reactor. And let's inspect the project for a second in the uh, editor. We see here a similar structure as we just saw. We have an application which relies upon an API module and the API module has an implementation module. Now, let's try to uh, see what that means in practice. The coffee shop app uses a particular API and the API is implemented by that other project, by that other module. Fine. If I would be building the project with Maven 3, it would be fine because I'm building the root project here. Let's say that we do test-driven development, so I'm going to run Maven 3 test.
Now I'm greeted with a failing test case. Well, that makes sense. If we do test-driven development, we, we start a test. We, we start by writing the test, and then we try to make the test green. This test is red, so we have to fix it. Makes perfect sense. And the test that we are talking about is the bean burner impulse test. Let's pick it up. It's over there, the test folder that we have it. And we have a bean grinder. We throw in some beans and we expect that we get something back, um, but we do not. Why do we not get something back? Test is failing. Ah, it's probably because we haven't implemented it yet. Well, it doesn't have to be hard. We can just return some object and then at least our test will be green, right? Because the result is now no longer a null value. Well, Maven is very helpful to us. It says you can correct the problem and then you can resume the build. Well, let's try to do that. Let's try to resume the build. Uh, dash RF for resume from. And I can resume from the coffee shop impulse module. And of course, I should still say that I want to run the test. Now my build is still failing. And there's an interesting thing happening here. Um, earlier, we would see improve reactor demo, then API, then implementation, then app. Now, Maven Free says, okay, I'm going to, to build the implementation for you. But that's not what I asked for. Or, well, it's what I asked for, but here we can see that Maven does not understand that there's a parent project. And actually, that's also what it's saying over here. It's saying I have a dependency on the coffee shop API, but I cannot find the palm for it. I don't have any dependency information. Um, and that also means that I can't resolve the dependency at all, which is why the build is failing. That's a bit of a shame because earlier it said that we could resume the build like that, but in fact, we cannot. Let's run this scenario again. I'm going back to a failing test case, this time with Maven 4. I'm going to run Maven 4 test. Now we expect the test still to be failing. And now there's a slightly slight difference. First of all, it says after correcting the problem, you can resume the build with NVNR dash R, which is just resume. So rather than Maven telling me hey, I got this far. Good luck figuring out and resuming the build for me. Maven now says, I got this far, but if you invoke me a second time, I know where I left off and I can resume from there. So let's again, make sure our test will pass. Oh wait, before we do that, we need to take a little look at this file, because here it says in this property file, target resume properties, it says remaining projects. So that's the projects that we still have left to build. It's the coffee shop impulse and the coffee shop AP, uh, app module. Those are still left to be built. Now, back to the terminal. Maven, resume the build, run the test goal. And it says, all right, build success. I've managed to build and test the implementation and build and test the app itself. As I said, it remembers where to resume from based on that um, resume properties file. But the more important thing is what it, where Maven first would say, okay, this is the project that you want to build. Let me try to build it. It now first builds the model of the whole project. So the multi-module project, including the parent, including all the other modules in the project. And then it strips off what has already been done, leaving what is left to be done, then starts to build them. But if you then have a dependency from, let's say, implementation on API, it says, okay, even though I'm not going to build the API, I do know where to find it because it's in the, it, it's in the folder next to this one and I can resolve the dependency from there. 
before with Maven 3, this was not the case, and that's why many product instructions still say you need to run Maven install first. Because with Maven install, it will install this API module in the local repository. That, that's the M2 repository folder under your user directory. And from there, I'm going to resolve it during the build. Now, this is one thing that we have improved in the reactor, but there's also a lot of other things that the reactor can now do, which it could previously not do. So we have options for, uh, for instance, for saying, I can build just one submodule, let's say the uh, coffee shop API, uh, no, the app module, um, compile, of course. Um, I could do that with or without and also make switch. This was there before, but again, it would not understand if I have a dependency from the app on the um, on the implementation. It would say, I don't understand how that is going to be, how that needs to be built. With Maven 4, it says, okay, I can actually resume that dependency inside the project and I can build it even without saying AM. AM stands for also make, which means that if I do this, Maven 3 builds the coffee shop app module with also make, it would compile both the API and the implementation and the app, would compile all three of it. Whereas with Maven 4, if I do this, it will build only the app and it will, will resolve the API in the implementation without building them. So this is this is uh, this allows you to have a much more fine-grained control on what is going to be built or not. We have um, profile activation, which now also works for profiles that may or may not be there. So let's say that I can say uh, I, I could say. Um, um, let's see. Uh, the, the profile switch is dash is, is capital P. I could say run it. I believe this is the right syntax, but I need to do compile too. Yeah, so now it says requested profile could not be activated or deactivated because they don't exist. If I would have been doing this with Maven 3, it would have said um, it's, it's considered a warning and it says requested profile run. It's with a question mark. So in Maven 3, one would do this and it would say run ITS could not be activated. Uh, that's a warning. And in Maven 4, we can say, well, if it exists, the run ITS profile, then I would like it to be activated. And otherwise, it's not a problem. And that's why the warning has become an info message, because I specified that if it's not there, it's not a problem. On the other hand, if I would say activate this profile, but I do not give the question mark, I'm saying the profile must be there. And then Maven stops with an error saying, you requested a profile, but I could not activate or deactivate it because it simply doesn't exist. And this is more in line with how the project selection also works. All right, um, enough about this. There's a lot of um, a lot more things, but we still have to finish our dessert, and it would be a shame if we had to skip that. And our dessert is the Maven Demon. Now, what's the Maven Demon all about? The Maven Demon is actually a, a new project in the Maven, uh, under the umbrella of the Maven top level project within the Apache Software Foundation that provides faster builds. Well, I don't know about you, but if my build can get faster, I'm typically a very happy user. 
And how do we do that? We do that using a daemon process. This daemon process is actually a, a background process that keeps the JVM that was used to invoke Maven and the plugin definitions uh, warm. So what we typically do if we run MVN, it's a shell script or a CMD script that boots a JVM, starts reading the project, reads all the plugin definitions, and then finally gets to the point where I can build my project. The Maven daemon, on the other hand, says, okay, the JVM is there. I'll keep it in a steady state, in a ready state. I've loaded all your project plugins. And now the only thing that I have to do is tell this JVM to, uh, to run a particular goal on the project. What it also does is that it runs a multi-threaded build by default without cluttering the output. Well, there's a lot of things that were on that previous um, list. So let's see in practice what they mean. And for that, I'm moving to a different project, which is going to be just Maven itself, because that project is a little bit bigger than my usual demo projects. All right. I'm going to clean the project. This is always a bit of a scary moment because demos can easily go wrong. But let's assume that they will run just fine today. And otherwise, I have a backup plan, don't worry. So, as you can see, the Maven project itself consists of 30 modules. And if I would be running a Maven compile on it, and that's going to be Maven free, of course, we can see that it runs in sequence. So it says there's 30 modules, and I'm going to build the first one, the second one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, that's a bit of a shame. We have a build failure here. Um, Let's go back to the backup plan then. File it using the Maven daemon as well. It will say it starts a new daemon that's expected because no, there was one, there was not one available. Um, the project is now built in four seconds. Okay, that's maybe a bit of cheating. So let's clean the project um, and let's compile it again using the Maven daemon. One second still. What? Zero to fifteen seconds. Let's clean it again. Let's build it again using the Maven daemon. One second. Let's, just to be sure, let's clean it again and now use a regular Maven, so not the, the daemon, and compile it again. Almost four seconds. So what's happening here? The thing is, First of all, Maven Daemon keeps a JVM warm. And as we know, booting a JVM can easily take a second or something. But the second thing is, and that's much more interesting, it keeps plugin definitions warm. And the plugin definitions, in this case, I've used the Scala Maven plugin for a reason. It loads a Scala compiler and a Scala language, which are pretty heavy to load. And the Maven Daemon actually keeps them in memory. And as soon as I run compile, for instance, it just fires a request to that already running JVM with all the plugin definitions available and whatnot, and says, hey, I want you to run the compile goal, which is a lot faster because it doesn't have to, compile, to, to load the plugin definition, to load the Scala compiler. It will already be there and just be able to execute immediately. So that's a big improvement over there.
what we can do, by the way, is we can inspect the status of the maven daemon. We can see that one daemon is uh, waiting idly for us to, uh, to execute a new build request, and it uses this particular Java runtime. Now, as you can see, I'm invoking MVND rather than MVN. And the difference here is that MVND is actually a, a client executable, which will take my, my request to run, for instance, the compile goal, and fires it against this daemon that is running over there on process 49.799, rather than booting up the JVM, as I described earlier. So, we've had four courses. It's time for a little wrap up, actually. And then we have some time for questions left. And the first thing, uh, a question that I often get asked when I do this talk is, okay, when can we use all of this? And that's why I want to discuss some timelines with you. So the Maven wrapper is already available today. It's as simple as that you can, you can start using it um, uh, and benefit from that in your projects. The decoupling of the build POM and the consumer POM is something that will uh, ship in Maven 4. The feature is done from a technical perspective. It's just something that we cannot reasonably backport into Maven 3. Even if we wanted to, we don't have the time for it. Um, but it's also from a technical perspective, it's, it's such a big a change inside Maven that we, that we decided it must go into the next major version of Maven. It also uh, is a big change in the sense that some plugins that you use in your build may need updating or replacement. Um, that's because where well, we previously said the pom.xml that you have in your directory, that, that's the one that we are going to, for instance, sign or upload. And plugins need to be aware of the fact that now they need to sign or upload a different file. All the improvements in the reactor and in the command line are also available in Maven 4. They're not going to make it until Maven 3. And then finally, we have the Maven daemon, which is already working and available today. I used to say it doesn't work on Apple Silicon, but it does since version 0.8.2, which was released last October. Also, and we didn't get to see that today, unfortunately, but it's good to take that into mind. If you use any Maven plugins that are not thread safe, don't use the Maven daemon. As I said, the Maven daemon will by default spawn a multi-threaded build. So if you have more than one module, it will just start building the modules at the same time. If you have non-thread safe plugins, they share the JVM. Um, you, you may run into unexpected problems. So that's something you, like, you really need to check for yourself if you have any of those plugins. And if you do, then verify if you need to upgrade them, replace them, rewrite them, whatever. So summarizing Maven Wrapper and Maven Daemon are already available today. You can use them and benefit from them. Improved Reactor and Build Consumer POM are technically done um, you can use them uh, as for the reactor, but be aware of the caveats. And for the build consumer problem, you can use them in Maven 4. And then the next question that I usually get is, so you speak about this Maven 4 a lot. When will we see Maven 4? Well, that's where we actually need your help. Because we already have a few alpha snapshots of Maven 4. What, uh, let me rephrase that. We have a few alpha releases already of Maven 4. As for myself, I'm using a snapshot build of Maven 4 for, I think, two plus years. It has proven to be quite stable for me. Uh, but we also have snapshots 2 and uh, alpha 2 and alpha 3 releases, which you can just download and run for yourself and see how your build works on that version. We see some open source projects that are already test driving these versions of Maven 4 and they are reporting issues. And that's exactly the kind of feedback that we would like to have. So, so give that, that alpha version a test on your project 
if you find any issues, make sure you can reproduce them so that you can help us out by saying, if I do this, if I have this particular setup, then that problem is happening and I don't want it to happen. And then finally report that to us. It would be a great help if you could include a reproducer project, which really isolates the problem to its bare minimum. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you want to check out the demo project, there's a GitHub page where you can download them. They have instructions on how you can run them and you can follow me on Twitter as well. I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. So I would love to, uh, to answer any questions that you may have at this point.